Welcome to Health IQ. I'm Dr. Alan Siegel. Uh, today we have a special guest, Dr. Brandon Erickson. He's with the Rothman Orthopedic uh, Group here in Westchester. Uh, they have offices in Tarrytown and uh, Harrison, New York. Welcome, Dr. Erickson. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. So uh, I was looking over your bio, and one of my interesting points about you is that you were a former college athlete. So before we get into the whole medical uh, background here, I wanted to get a a uh, little background on yourself as an athlete and how you got into orthopedics. Sure. So I grew up in Jersey, Central Jersey, uh, Marlboro, New Jersey, and uh, I'm a Jersey guy. So, so, I, yep, I, so we're <laughs> same thing, you know. And uh, you know, some people some people are not a fan of it. I love it. I yeah. love being from Jersey. Um, you know, so I, you know, Irish Catholic kid. I uh, loved Notre Dame growing up. So went there for undergrad. Did not get recruited, of course. Um, but when I went there. Decided after freshman year, you know, sitting in the stands, missing playing football, uh, that I would try to walk on. And having watched Rudy a bunch of times and, and having an idea of what it was, I said, all right, let me just give it a shot. I can definitely do what these guys are doing on the field. I was very wrong. They were much, <laughs> they were much better than I was. Um, but I was very fortunate. Uh, Charlie Weiss had just become the coach. And... Um, he, they needed some walk-on, so myself and a few other guys made the team, and then uh, you know we tried it our freshman year, and we played we played the rest of uh, my college time. I, I played very little. Um, I uh, I was on the scout team a lot and, and took a lot of big hits. Um, and actually, when you ask about orthopedics, it's kind of the cliche story. But when I was a junior. Um, Actually, the, first, the last practice before our opening game against Georgia Tech our junior year um, took a pretty big hit coming across the middle. Unfortunately, my leg got stuck in the ground, and so my legs didn't spin, my body spun, so I had an open fracture dislocation of my ankle when I was a junior. Um, Training staff, doctors there, fantastic. Had me in the operating room in an hour and a half. Um, had me fixed up, screwing some plates, fixed everything up, and then uh, they actually had me rehabbed and ready to go by uh, you know about three quarters of the way through the season. So I thought that was one of the greatest things that that ever happened. That kind of got me interested in orthopedics. I had been interested in medicine for a while, but that kind of really got me into orthopedics and and having the having the athlete side of it and then being able to have the kind of doctor side of it has actually really helped me. Uh, that's terrific. So the persistence and perseverance of being a uh, walk-on athlete at Notre Dame, I'm sure helped get you through your career and get you through medical school and, and into a surgical residency, and uh, that was mm -hmm. probably a good experience for you. So, so for all those kids and all those uh, people aspiring to be college athletes, you know, tell them to go for it, right? Absolutely, and, and, do it. And, and, it teaches you great time management, yeah. if nothing else. I mean, you have to practice for 40 hours a week and then do your science classes. Right. So. And you're also a uh, research, research, research consultant for Major League Baseball, as well as an assistant team physician for the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, why don't you tell us about that experience working yeah, with them? Yeah, it's they've been great. Um, I was uh, when I was in Chicago initially, I helped out with the White Sox for a little bit. Then when I came to New York, I helped out with the Mets for a little bit. And then since joining Rothman, uh, I started with the Phillies. And it's been a great experience. Their training staff is great. The players are fantastic. Uh, they've been very receptive to having me around. Um, I, you know, we go down to spring training for a week out of the season, and then when they come up here to play the Mets, I cover them up here. So it's a great way to stay involved in baseball and, and help team and help out our practice. Um, as far as research with Major League Baseball, um, Major League Baseball does a really good job of keeping track of injuries that happen to players. They have a really good injury database system. It's called HITS, um, and it was started years back. And so because the athletic trainers who work for Major League Baseball do a really good job and, and work really hard about putting in injury data and operative reports and imaging and things like that into this system, we now have, or Major League Baseball now has a very big system or a very big collection of data on their players over the last 10 years or so. And so we've been fortunate in that um, some of the uh, people who work at Major League Baseball have helped us kind of to, you know, de-identify data so we never know who, who's having what done, but we just have kind of the raw statistics of who, of certain procedures and how players did before and after. And so we can kind of then produce some research papers that say, okay, let's say you uh, needed a Tommy John surgery, right? Well, we know that if you need a Tommy John surgery data, they've given us, you have about an 85% chance of getting back to pitching in Major League Baseball if you're a Major League Baseball pitcher. It also tells us a little bit about the incidence and some of the injuries. So again, Tommy John surgery, shoulder and elbow problems, ACL tears, things like that. So we can look up all this data and it helps us counsel patients a lot of times, specifically baseball patients, um, with this particular data on if their injury is common, how long they can expect to be out, and what they can expect if they have to have surgery. So your experience with Major League athletes and professional athletes also helps your career with just the weekend warrior type of patients because 
you learn so much about you know yeah. dealing with professional athletes but then you know we have the everyday you know moms that are out there probably watching our show tonight versus uh the, the professional athletes who probably, probably not why i probably not watch it that's okay yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so we want to talk uh, to them a little bit and and describe how um uh their injuries are affected by what they do you know playing tennis playing golf uh just trying to stay active in their lives and you know everyone uh, can relate to a shoulder problem you know tennis players uh you know, maybe some weekend uh, volleyball players, maybe some guys still playing a little softball out there, maybe still playing a little baseball, whatever. So, so let's talk about some of the more common shoulder injuries that, that can occur with like the weekend warrior type set, you know. The analytics uh, for the major league professional people, these, these people want to get back to playing their weekend ball and, and, and stay active, uh, like you and I. <laughs> yeah, well that's it, we are falling into that category yes, okay. now because we're not, you know, you're not training every day for a sport. And, right. You know, it's funny, we always use the term weekend warriors, and so, you know, what does that really mean? I would tell you, you know, somebody who's not actively involved in a sport, you know, whether it's high school, college, professional athletes, or is involved in a team where they practice and play, kind of falls into that weekend warrior, um, you know, realm. When you're, you know, playing pickup basketball once a month, or when you're playing tennis every couple weeks, um, but you don't have a regular training schedule, you probably fall into that weekend warrior category. And by you, I mean you and I do yeah. too, because this is what we're at now. You know, you, you're very busy with work, and so on the weekends you want to try to keep yourself in shape. So you go play racquetball, you go play tennis, you go play squash, um, whatever sport you like to do. But you're not constantly training, and it puts you at a little bit of a disadvantage because if you think about the pro athletes, somebody's watching them train all the time, they're basically being paid to train, whereas you and I are not, but we enjoy doing it, so we're gonna go ahead and do it. So speaking of shoulder problems and kind of the weekend athlete, shoulder problems and probably knee problems are two of the most common things we see. And I think one of the most common shoulder issues that we see in our weekend warriors is something called impingement, right? So I, I see a lot of patients who come into the office or just, you know, ask me questions randomly and they'll say, listen, I, somebody told me I have impingement, whether it was a therapist or an athletic trainer or a friend who had the same problem. Um, and they say, listen, you know, I have shoulder impingement. What do I do? So it's a good question. Probably have to start with, you know, what is shoulder impingement? Why are you getting it? And so, you know, when we talk about the shoulder, um, we always talk about the ball and socket joint. But the shoulder is really made up of four joints. It has this AC joint on the top, this sternicular, or meaning your um, <clears throat> chest wall joint over here with your clavicle as it attaches to your ribcage. It has the glenohumeral joint, which is the ball and socket part, and then it has your shoulder blade joint, or your scapular thoracic joint. And so we very much focus on the ball and socket, but actually it's the shoulder blade that's probably the most important thing uh, when we talk about the shoulder. And so when People aren't doing shoulder exercises a lot. So a lot of people will go to the gym, they'll lift, they'll do some bench press, they'll do some bicep curls. Um, they may or may not do some back exercises like rows and lat pull downs and things like that. When you don't do a lot of back exercises, or even when you do, um, and you just aren't hyper-focused on it, your shoulder blade can start to move in a funny direction. And what happens is it starts to actually kick off your rib cage a little bit, and it starts to tip forward. And you can get something called wing of your scapula, where your shoulder starts to wing out or kick to the side. You know, if you're at home doing this, you can put your hand against the wall and push your shoulder back and see if you have a really big prominent shoulder blade in the back. You probably have some winging. Or you can have somebody watch you from behind as you raise your hands up and down and see how your shoulder blade moves. I don't know, are those some of the Test you use to see if somebody has yeah, scapular the wing or various uh, scapular tests to see, and then some postural assessments as well to see if they're like forward shoulders and forward neck and things of that nature can be probably pre-indicative of some shoulders as well. Absolutely, and, and neck issues, of course. And it doesn't help yeah. that we're on our phones and our computers all the time. Right, we're right. sitting so, down yeah, like this. Yeah, Posturally, so when we talk about the back exercises, I try and explain to patients, and you know, all good therapists and, uh, and chiropractors always want to strengthen the back muscles. Hmm. It's very important. Because we're never focused, we don't focus on them. Right. Because exactly. nobody sees nobody them. Nobody sees them. Right. Exactly. So nobody cares. <laughs> so, so what happens when the shoulder blade starts to move funny is it kicks a little bit to the side and it starts to tip forward. Well, what happens when it tips forward? If you can see what I'm doing here, it kind of kicks this way and goes forward. There's an um, there's a space between this bone here, which is called your acromion, and your ball part of the ball and socket here, or your um, humeral head. And what lives in the space between here is your rotator cuff. And so you can imagine it's that it's not a lot of space. It's not a lot of space. It's not exactly right. And some people have big spurs that come off of this bone, whether because they were born like that or they've had some shoulder injuries in the past. So they're really at risk for things like this because usually the weekend warriors were warriors at some point. Right, right. So now they're, now they're weekend warriors. They may have had some shoulder trauma. And so if you really start to decrease that small amount of space, as you start to bring your arm up, well, as you come up here, you can imagine that if your shoulder blade's not in the right spot, that rotator cuff can get pinched against that bone right there, and you can get something called impingement. 
Now, this is called external impingement. There is something called internal impingement. That's more for throwing athletes, probably not relevant in this setting. But for the external impingement you get here, you're basically banging the ball part of the ball and socket into this bone here, and it's pinching the rotator cuff under there. And it can actually wear it away, kind of like a cheese grater. And so there's a lot of things we can do to get what this. What movements would a patient experience? Uh, what cause it. Yeah, cause. Yeah, it's yeah. a good question. So usually bringing the arm out to the side. So when we call abduction, as, right. as we're very familiar with. So as you bring the arm out to the side, that really tests that space there. A lot of times as you bring it out to the front, as you can see here, it doesn't really start to hit that. But as you come out to the side here, if this shoulder blade isn't working properly, that'll bang it to the side. And People almost feel like as they get up to a certain point, it pinches, and then a lot of times when they get past a certain point, it actually gets better. So let's say you get up to 90 degrees or so, and it starts to hurt, and it hurts up until maybe 130, 140, and then as you get up to 170 degrees, it actually gets a little bit better because now this starts to translate back down and stops hitting here. So you get that pinching sensation. It can happen on the way up or on the way down, um, but it can cause a, a good amount of pain, like a sharp pain. Um, and so activities that cause you to bring your arm out to the side like that, so serving in tennis, play, hitting balls in squash, racquetball, et cetera, all the things that we talked about, throwing a baseball. Not as much throwing a softball, but it can, but it's mostly underhand, but overhead type activities can all predispose you to third have baseman, this. Third, third baseman, right, every, third baseman. Everybody, right, everybody except the pitcher, everybody except the pitcher. Yeah, you know, and we, you know, third baseman yeah. whip the ball pretty hard, so you know, so it's yeah, center fielder, yeah. things like that. A lot of Certainly, softball players out there, so I, yeah, yeah. I don't hate, I don't hate yeah. it at all. We yeah. did it when I was yeah. in med school, we had yeah. a league, we played against the yeah. other team, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, it's good. So. So that can happen a lot of times. And so what people have is they'll have pain in their shoulder. Now, if it gets worse and it starts to persist where it bothers them at night, so it's not just happening when they're playing, it's starting to carry over to their daily activities when they're uh, sleeping at night, it's waking them up when they roll over onto that side. A lot of times that's because the rotator cuff is starting to get worn down. And when you have a tear in the rotator cuff, it can cause you some pain at night. So when you have pain just when you're playing, Usually your rotator cuff's okay most of the time. When that starts to come bother you at night or with kind of your activities of daily living, then your rotator cuff can start to be affected, especially if you have some weakness or some loss of motion. So that's one, of, I would say, impingement's probably the most common thing we see in our weekend warriors in their right. shoulder. And you mentioned, you mentioned a tear, just to clarify, yeah. can someone tear their rotator cuff just by throwing too hard or is it typically more gradual? Uh, over time, more of a chronic thing where it slowly tight degrades the tendon? Yeah. Um, what's more common, Mike, is it? It's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's probably a little bit of both. So okay. certainly a big trauma to the shoulder. You fell, you dislocate your shoulder over the age of 40 years old or so, you're probably going to tear your rotator cuff. Um, if you are a repetitive athlete, so you're throwing batting practice for your high school team and you're throwing three or 400 pitches a day and you have some impingement, that's more of that chronic overtime injury. Um, you can, if you have a little bit of that chronic overtime injury and then throw or something happens when you're throwing, you can kind of complete that tear and get that right. pop. Um, but you really want to get the guy out of first. That's right? yeah. <laughs> as long as you get them out, <laughs> right. you know, and it's you know you win, right. then it's okay. Yeah. Uh, we can always fix it. You know, obviously the game is always the most important thing. Her say, you know, you play Weekend to win, play to win the game. Exactly. You, know, you have to play to win the game. So. But so, yeah, so that can happen. So either over time or an acute injury, like you said. But I would say generally it's more of the overtime kind of attritional or kind of an insidious onset where it starts to bug you and then it bugs you more and then it bugs you more. A lot of people come in and say, this has been bugging me for a year and a half, two years. I just haven't done anything about it, you know? Right. And then, you know, then it becomes a question of what do you do, right? So you have this impingement or this is what you think you have. And so well, what do you do? Do you stop playing? I'm not a fan of that, and I know you're not either, of telling somebody, listen, you, you have to hang up your cleats or hang up your, ba you know, your softball bat. I would much rather have people play the sports they want to play, but us get them in a place where they can do that safely and effectively. So from an impingement perspective, like you said, it's all about the back exercises. So it's all about things like rows. It's all about things like lat pull downs. It's all about things like band work. Everybody hates bands. I love bands. <laughs> I, oh, I don't love doing them, but I love them because they're a great thing. You can get them for $5 at the store, and you can do some really good exercises with bands to work on bringing your shoulder blades back um, and pinching them together when you start to get back and almost dropping them down. And even if you do this right now, I mean, if you, if you go ahead, try it. So you bring your shoulder blades back, you have your arms up here, you don't cross your midline here, you pinch your shoulder blades together and you try to dunk them down. Yeah. I feel that like crazy in my yeah. shoulder blades yes. and in my muscles in the back. And there's a lot of things, your serratus, your rhomboids, et cetera. The exact muscles you're activating isn't as important as just knowing that those are the muscles that you're right. gonna activate. And so what you do what you do by activating those muscles is you actually put the shoulder back in a better position. So now it sits where it's it needs to sit. Realignment, basically. You realign it, right. exactly. Right. And so it's not just a, it, it shouldn't be just a short-term realignment fix. It should fix actually 
it should be a permanent fix for you because once you get that back down, now you have to continue your exercises, of course. Uh, once you get that back down, a lot of times this inflammation goes away. You can always take some anti-inflammatories. You know, people always ask about what can I take aside from the non-steroidals over the cattle, you know, the Aleves, the Motrin, things like that. I, I've talked and I'm curious what you think about um, uh, kind of natural anti-inflammatories. So I, I usually tell people about turmeric and tart cherry juice are the two things I tell people kind of natural very commonly known for, you know, natural anti-inflammatory. And everything, yeah. everything works to a degree. Uh, sometimes if they're doing the right dosage, it also has to be consistently taken for right. it to work well in the system. Uh, people do want the immediate relief, as we know, if they're in pain, so they will go for the Advils, the Aleves, or, or whatever. But, you know, for people that want longer term, you know, low inflammation in their body, those are definitely uh, yeah. items that we use. Yeah. And that's, you know, so if, you know, somebody's gonna either, the, the um, certainly the Aleves and the Iprosins are fine, those natural anti-inflammatories are fine, and I would give it, you know, a little bit of time of you doing the exercises and trying to take those anti-inflammatories and seeing if that helps. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's a little, there's a thing called a bursa sac, which is this little uh, bit of tissue over here that has some fluid in it that helps things glide smoothly, and that can get really inflamed as this continues to bang into this. Sometimes you just can't quite kick that with the anti-inflammatories and doing your exercises. So occasionally we have to do a, a one-time steroid injection into the shoulder. Um, steroid injections are not the devil. Um, they're okay to have, uh, not repeatedly over a long period of time, but a one-time steroid injection to help decrease the inflammation in your shoulder so that you can do your therapy and you can do your exercises more effectively. I'm totally fine with. We use it in our pros a lot. We use it in our weekend warriors a lot. So I think a, a one-time injection has a low risk of something going wrong. There's always risk anytime. I think it's a low risk, and so that if you can't get yourself better with you know the things you're doing at home, that's when you come to see me, and usually I'll recommend a one-time injection. I think the key, you. the key you said is uh, they can do their therapy. If they can't get their exercises right. done because the pain is prohibiting them, it doesn't really help them progress. So right. they, if they understand that, that, uh, that injection doesn't seem so, you know, so bad. Right. And it's just so, a one-time yeah. one thing. It's a one-time thing. thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You I'm don't sure want to do repeated, it. Repeated steroid injections in the same area is not recommended by, right. you know, most good, uh, good no, orthopedists. We, <laughs> usually not. I mean, you know, listen, you have knee arthritis right. and you're trying to avoid knee replacement you want to get, that's fine. That's yeah, a different story. That's periodic, right. Up here. The joints are shot. Tenon, the <laughs> joint shot. Exactly. The joint shot. Yeah. Up here, a good looking joint. Yeah. Tendons, you don't want to do them over time. Can right. degrade the tendons, things like that. Sure. So, totally agree with you. Um, the other thing we can probably mention, we're talking about impingement, is your biceps tendon. So a lot of people will often have some pain in the front of their shoulder over here. So, you know, they'll come in and they'll say, Doc, it's, you know, it, it hurts right over here. And your biceps tendon, there's two parts to it. One comes off of this bone over here called your coracoid, your short head. And one comes actually off inside your shoulder joint and exits out the side of your shoulder in this little groove over here. And they come together as you come over here to make that big muscle that everybody works out, right? And then they come down to your forearm over here and they insert. And so you can injure one or both of those tendons, but most commonly, especially in our overhead athletes, our tennis players, our uh, squash players, racquetball, the biceps tendon usually gets affected. And the reason is because if you think about it, if it's starting inside your shoulder joint and has to then run outside your shoulder joint, anything that can irritate the shoulder is going to irritate that tendon. So when you start to get the, these impingement type symptoms, your biceps tendon actually can also get affected. You can start to actually see a lot of red inflamed tissue that comes over here. When we're, you know, when we do surgery on the shoulder, we look in with uh, what's called an arthroscope or a small little camera, and we can look at the biceps tendon inside the shoulder, and you actually see almost like somebody took a piece of, or um, like a lipstick thing, and just drew a line right over the top of the biceps. It looks really inflamed, really irritated, and those are the people who complain of this kind of pain in the front of their shoulder here. A lot of the same stuff that we talked about for the impingement usually gets that bicep tendonitis better. You may have to take a little time off of throwing to get that better um, and do your scapula work and do the anti-inflammatories and consider an injection, uh, but a lot of times that can get better as well. What about weightlifters? Would that be uh, something that they may experience as well? A lot yeah. of people are lifting a lot of weights repetitively a couple times a week potentially yeah. depending on the exercise they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, weightlifters can definitely get that. The, um, the other thing that weightlifters get, and I don't know if, much, if, you, if you see this a lot, is some arthritis in this joint over here, their AC joint. Um, guys who lift a lot, bench a lot of weight. Um, they've been lifting for 20, 30 years, and you know, now they're, you know, they're still in the gym, they're still lifting heavy weight, which I mean, I, was, I can't lift, I don't lift nearly as heavy as I used to. Warriors, you see them in the gym, they, they may not work out, but then right. they go to the gym and they try and do too much, or, or, exactly. or even over time, over 20 years, they, they've been doing this for a long time, so. The doing too much with the form thing is a good point. You know, when you start to go back to lifting, um, just as an aside from what we're talking about, form is very important. So right. as if you haven't lifted in a while, you're going back, you want to get back into it, that's awesome. Watch yourself in a mirror, 
see what you look like if you're doing, if you're trying new exercises, get with a trainer, have them look at your form. Um, because if you start to lift, in, you know, kind of not in the right way or improperly, um, you really can flare up your shoulder, flare up your knee, things like that. So just to avoid things like that happening, I would recommend either having, either watching yourself do it if you know what proper form is supposed to look like, or if you don't, just have a trainer look at you or a friend who knows, what, you know, who's maybe lifted a little bit more, just take a look at you while you're doing it. Prevents it prevents injuries and surely, uh, you know, it will help uh, with the corrective exercises that we spoke about to make sure you're doing them properly. Right. You're looking for the results, whether it's corrective exercise or just, just general health and, and well-being for, uh, you know, physique or endurance or strength or whatever your, whatever your goal is. So, uh, so the shoulder, uh, a lot of you know, injuries obviously for weekend warriors can, can occur. Um, you know, surgical intervention, it sounds like you have a pretty conservative approach, which is a great mm -hmm. uh, approach, I believe. Uh, you know, sometimes people need surgery. It, you know, it, it, yes. the rotator cuff is, is, is shot, the biceps is, is not going to get better. Uh, so there's obviously you know, arthroscopic procedures mm -hmm. for both, uh, both of those injuries that we spoke about. Um, but doing, doing the rehab, doing the conservative approach, doing the follow-up, uh, and if they need surgery, you know, it, it's usually pretty good. The recovery time on rotator cuff is a little bit longer or yeah, about the long. same. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's, yeah, it's longer yeah, than yeah. people think. I mean, yeah. it, from a surgical perspective, the, the surgery, you know, you go to somebody who does a lot of them and it's not, it's not a tear, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a routine surgery. Obviously, everybody's a little different, so every tear pattern is a little different. You always address the individual tear pattern. So we have lots of different constructs that we use to fix the rotator cuff. Um, we have lots of things we do with the biceps tendon. But let's say you have a, you know, a, centimeter, two centimeter tear in your rotator cuff. And we go in arthroscopically, which means through some poke holes like the size of my finger. Um, we kind of fix, we put these little anchors into the bone and then we run some sutures up through the tendon and we bring it back down to the bone. And it's actually a pretty strong construct. The surgery itself, you know, it takes an hour, an hour and a half or so. And then the real problem starts. Not <laughs> problem, but then the real work starts. Right. Because that's when you guys actually have way more to do with how they do than, than what I did. Because as long as I put the rotator cuff in a good spot and I do everything properly in surgery, the hope is that that rotator cuff heals fine. But there's a lot of other things that have to happen for their shoulder to be happy after the rotator cuff heals. If they get a stiff shoulder afterwards because we weren't moving it enough or like you know, what they call a frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a problem. That hurts. That's yes, painful. Yeah. Um, it would be more they, painful than the first problem. A, a, absolutely. So that's, and that's to your point of being yeah. conservative. That's right. why, you know, listen, a lot of people will get better. The body's amazing. The body can do a lot of things. A lot of people get better without surgery. If you need it, that's fine and we're good at it. But, you know, we try to avoid it if we can because you'd be surprised how many times people wind up getting better, you know, doing the right rehab, doing the right exercises. But recovery from a rotator cuff repair, like you said, it's, it's a four to six month recovery to get back from that because usually what happens afterwards is we put you in a sling because we want the rotator cuff to heal, right? The sutures we put in there are very strong, but if somebody like you were, if I were to fix your shoulder and you were to go ahead and lift your arm up, you are much stronger than the sutures I put in there. So you would tear those out in a heartbeat if you started to move your shoulder too much. So usually we wait until four weeks or so to start even therapy really because we want everything to heal down. Then we start with passive motion, meaning you're lifting their shoulder, but the person who had their rotator cuff fixed is not activating their muscles to use it. So somebody's moving their shoulder for them. Once they get their passive motion back, six week mark or so, then we let them do some active assisted motion where somebody helps them move their shoulder, but they're also moving it into active motion. Then we start the strengthening program around 10-ish weeks, depending on the tear pattern, how good the tissue was, things like that. There's all kind of patient-specific things that dictate how I treat them postoperatively and how you know we work together treating them postoperatively. Um, and once they get their strength back, then they can start their kind of return to sport type exercises. But if you're an overhead athlete, if you're a throwing athlete, it's going to take you at least seven to nine months to get back to throwing overhead after having rotator cuff repair, which is, that's a long time. That's a long chunk of change. You're not feeling bad that whole time. You feel pretty good after, you know, after a month or two. But to, for you to get back to doing what you want to do, it takes time. Yeah, it's not an easy recovery, but the driving force for people to decide to have surgery or not have surgery, uh, is it typically the pain level or the pain is not getting better versus compensa uh, compensation or not being able to move motion-wise or maybe not being able to throw the ball as hard as they want to? It's usually pain is typically the driving force for people because yeah. sometimes you can see rotator cuff you know, uh, injuries on MRI, yep. but the pain level is not that bad. They may not be able to move their shoulder great, but you know, like, eh, it's not hurting you. Maybe you know, you're 40, 50 years old and yep. you know, maybe you're ending your softball career every day now <laughs> anyway, so you know, maybe surgery is not where we have to go with this, so it depends on the patient. Totally accurate. If you took you know, 100 people off the street who are over the age of 50 or 60, you MRI'd all of their shoulders, 
I bet you at least 30 or 40% of those people are going to have a MRI evidence of a rotator cuff tear. But they all may be totally asymptomatic. They're doing what they want to do. Um, I think pain is probably one of the biggest driving factors. When people can't sleep at night because their shoulder hurts, that's that's generally right. what pushes people towards surgery. That's a good point. We spoke about raising your arm up, but pain at night, sleeping yeah. is, is a big one with rotator cuffs. It's so. a tough one. I mean, yeah. if you're constantly getting woken up every couple hours because you're a side sleeper on your right, you roll over onto your right side, and then your shoulder wakes you up, and then you reposition yourself, and two hours later, you roll over onto your right side again, and it wakes you up again. Not getting a good night's sleep for right. the extended period is not great. All right. So we have a little bit of time left. I don't want to ignore some other joints that no, are in the body. <laughs> weekend warriors, you know, the shoulders. Put the nothing. shoulder, I put the you shoulder know, away here. I know you see a lot of knees, but we'll touch on the elbow real quick for our tennis and golfers out there. Sure. Um, what are just quick some of the quick injuries with, with tennis and golf injury uh, elbow? Yeah. We usually see repetitive overuse injuries in the elbow, whether it's from a tennis player or a golf player, even you know just people at work who have to do repetitive exercises all the time at work. Um, you see a lot of pain in the elbow. Obviously, there's a lot of things that run past the elbow, a lot of nerves, a lot of blood vessels, and you can certainly have issues with those. You can have issues with the bones. But from a muscle and tendon perspective, generally in the elbow, the things, at least that I see most commonly, are we call tennis elbow and golfer's elbow, right, appropriately named. So tennis elbow is pain usually on the outside of the elbow, right over that bump on the outside of your elbow. So if you feel the outside of your elbow and you feel a bump, it's usually just above and just this way towards that bump. And what that is is the tendons that help or the tendons that help you extend your wrist and turn your palm up come off of that bone right there. And if you repetitively have to do things where you extend your wrist, so whether you're hitting a backhand in tennis, whether you're uh, or turn your palm up, so whether you're constantly going doing this, um, you can get some degeneration in that tendon. It's, it's kind of misnamed, actually, epicondylitis or tennis elbow. Um, it's actually a process. So people usually say, listen, I tried some anti-inflammatories. It didn't do anything. It's because it's not really an inflammatory process. Uh, it's actually just degeneration of the tendon. And basically, you get these little micro tears, and your body can't heal them as fast as they're basically happening. So you wind up getting this degeneration. And at some point, you get over a tip. You kind of fall off an edge, and it starts to hurt. Is it from lack of blood supply to the area? Is it that is. why it's, it's hard to get those, yeah. those tears to heal? That's exactly right. So uh, something like uh, tendonitis for uh, PRP or for, would you use steroids in that in, you know, case? Or yeah. you maybe try a combination of different therapies for something like that conservatively? Yeah, so I always start with therapy first. Um, okay. A lot of times this will burn itself out over time. So golfer's elbows on the inside, tennis is on the outside. Um, a lot of times it burns itself out. It can take nine to 12 months though. And carrying things at your side, brushing your teeth can be really miserable. Um, I tell people to carry things with their palm up because if you think about it, when you're carrying something at your side, so you don't smack yourself in the leg every time you walk, uh, you have to extend your wrist. And so it starts to light that up. So carry, some, carry things in the other hand. I actually put people in a wrist splint for a little bit so they can't extend their wrist. And I have them get something called a flex bar. Um, and it's actually one of the things, there's been a randomized study on it. It actually has been shown to help this. And then I have them do therapy. If that doesn't work and they come back, I actually don't do steroid injections for this because I, again, it's not an inflammatory process. And a steroid is like putting a bottle of Advil into the spot you give the injection. Um, so I actually hold off on injections for a while. If it comes to the point where they can't get better um, with the therapy and the exercises, then I will offer PRP. What was um, the flex part thing you mentioned? What, what do they do with that? They're actually... Yeah, it's a little, it's a little, uh, it's kind of, it's circular. It's a tube um, and it has these ridges in it and it allows you to kind of go back and forth like this with okay. it. So it activates that tendon over there um, and you can kind of go up and down like this with it. So it helps to kind of stimulate blood supply to that area. So it's, that's the point of it, basically. And it's been shown in a randomized study actually to help a lot with pain, uh, what you get from golfer's elbow and tennis elbow. So again, a conservative approach to these types of injuries, sports injuries. Uh, I, I think you know the message to our viewers out there, especially the weekend warrior types, mm -hmm. you know, if they do experience discomfort, pain, uh, surely you know, uh, get it evaluated, uh, have somebody look at it. You don't want things that are degenerative or repetitive to continue to go on because you know then you can have tears and further things going wrong right. uh, and then you know making sure that you're working with a, a sports medicine specialist like yourself that can get them conservative care first and then you know monitor and manage that case and ultimately look you are a surgeon if they need surgery we do surgery but if not we hope you know eight out of ten people that see you probably don't need it anyway so probably higher, it's probably more it's like probably nine, higher, nine, nine out of ten, yeah, ten yeah. yeah which is great so uh no having a, a person like yourself in their rolodex where they can you yeah. know just know uh they can come in and see you and their family for various injuries in the in the family it's just a nice thing to have and you're local here in westchester yep. uh living in scarsdale practicing in harrison and tarrytown so our viewers should be able to find you uh 
rather quickly. So I'm always around. I'll yeah. always make time for anybody who wants to come right. in. It's you know injuries are frustrating, and athletes, right. as we know, are, are um, they want to get things done immediately, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everything needs to be done now. Yeah. So if you're hurt, always happy to see you. Always try to get you in the same day or the next I'm day. Always spend too much time with the Phillies. They'll love you yeah. more. So. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you very much for being on the show. I think it was uh, interesting for our viewers, and uh, if they have any more information, they will uh, reach out to you. Sounds okay. good. So thank you very much. Thanks, for being Appreciate it. Thanks for uh, watching Health IQ. Uh, Dr. Alan Siegel, we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, we do.